you doing? I am doing amazing, my man. What's going on? Talk to me. Hey, we just grateful and thankful for you taking out the time to pursue an interview with Aaron and Takara on the Aaron and Takara show. Yes, sir. Hey, appreciate you, Bobby. You. Hey, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for having me. No problem at all. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. You don't need no introduction. We're going to get right into it. Like, who, who is Bobby doing? You know what I'm saying? Who, who, who is Bobby doing? Do everybody want to know. We heard of your names everywhere. We've been introduced to you, but just, just let us know who's Bobby doing. Who is Bobby New? So Bobby New, Bobby New is many things. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, look, I got a bunch of names too. It's Bobby New, it's Robert New, Robert Napoleon. I mean, it's all these different things. Uh, um, I, I'm, I would say um, I am, for, for the most part, I am a man of God. That's number one. Um, I'm a family man. Um, I'm a musician. I'm a songwriter, a singer. Um, we're adding, you know, motivational speaker to that, um, as I feel like I have a lot to give in terms of hope to the inner city kids. Um, yeah, gospel singer, uh, three-time Grammy-nominated songwriter, um, musical family. Uh, you know, I come from the group, the Neutrons. That's that's way back. You know what I mean? Nineteen ninety. Um, yeah, man, that's that's who I am, and and a father for sure, proud father. Awesome. You mentioned something. Oh, and a husband. I'm sorry, and a husband. And a proud oh yeah, husband. yeah, absolutely. You know that's Get that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you mentioned several things we're gonna touch up on. But uh, I want to go back. Like, uh, let's dig dig a little deep back. Like, how, how would your spirits limit in a project such as your father being a Gangster pimp and having both parents on drugs while being involved in street life. Uh, what was that like for you growing up? You know, I, I did a lot of research and I wanted to tap in not just the, the re invented, how can I say, it? The, the newly Bobby New. I want to go back and then bring it up so our audience can get a good so idea of how you point. made it to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you said, how was that? I mean, it was good and bad. I mean, like if pe people that are, I think that are from where I'm from, like you, it's all you know. So when you're in it, you think it's fun. Like I, I, I didn't know I was in danger. You know what I'm saying? Like if I'm, if I'm loading guns or, or carrying dope for my dad, like I, I mean, it's all we knew. We were like little soldiers. So when I was in it, it was, that part of it was fun. Like, I mean, obviously there were some times when we didn't have any food or we didn't have uh, or if we was getting evicted from somewhere, or if we didn't have toilet paper or or uh, uh, toothpaste, like these these things obviously were a struggle. Like you, like yo, what the heck? Like how do we not have these things? Um, but that was the thing. Like when you're when you're in a life like that, where your dad is a hustler, you could have you know we could be living in a mansion in in uh, in Granada Hills, and then and the next day we living in a U-Haul truck. I mean, that's how, that's how extreme it was. Um, but again, for me, it was all I knew. So when I was in it, you know, it was good and bad. You know what I mean? Like, you see, like, again, like you said, you see your parents doing drugs, but that's the norm. So you don't even know that that's a bad situation. Like, I had no idea. I actually thought it was funny. Like, when my dad would be high, I would make fun of him. My brothers and sisters would be cracking up. You know what I mean? So I think a lot of it, you laugh. You know, you try to laugh through it so you don't cry. You know what I mean? Like you're just building this this strong outer protection, like you know, almost like a turtle. You know what I mean? So I don't know, man. I've been like I said, I've been surviving so long. You know, you 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 forget to live. But when I was in that, what you're talking about, it was all I knew. So it was like I said, it was either really good or really bad. And you be in survival mode, so you know you do what you gotta do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Bobby, um, as a youth, you were signed to Joe Jackson's record label, um, Jackson Records, or whatever. So, um, what was that experience like for you when you were with the Neutrons back in the eighties? You just spoke about just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that was in the eighties. Yeah, that, that was in the eighties. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Well, you know, with us being, you know, the Jacksons were everything to us. I mean, we're from the Motown 25 era. So, you know, when you saw Motown 25 and you saw Mike put that glove on and do that backslide, we had already all, we had been doing that already because we, we, we started out street performing, dancing. So we knew exactly what he was doing when they was calling it moonwalking. Um, we called it backsliding. Um, but we knew exactly what that was. And that's how we started out street performing on Fisherman's Wharf, Fisherman's Wharf, which is like the super touristy part of San Francisco. It's the pier. Um, we started out performing down there. Um, and so as we started winning talent shows around town and just performing everywhere, we cut our first 12 inch, which was, I did Why Do Fools Fall In Love, uh, Frankie Lyman version, and then Stone In Love With You, the stylistic song. It was a 12 inch where you had the two sides. Um, and so from there, we just hustled, we, we performed, we practiced, and we would go back and forth from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And that's, we would go down to what, what was called the Motown building. And we were just trying to be seen by anybody. We perform in the lobby, we, anybody. We, we see anybody going up on the elevator, we perform on the elevator, it didn't matter. And every time, because my dad had this, this, this thing about the Jacksons, Joe Jackson had an office in there and we would go to his office also and just try to meet him. And most of the time we would go there and we would just sit there and he would never see us. Um, and then the one time after going down there, probably, you know, five or six or seven times, um, we went there and we're waiting all day and it's getting towards the end of the day. So we starve and my dad goes to across the street to get us some Pioneer's chicken. And if you're from, you know, if you're from the West Coast, you know what Pioneer's is. We'll get to be, get the Pioneer's chicken. And so the door just happened to open. And when the door opened, I just ran through the door, uh, I was like, no, today we're gonna, we going today we're gonna meet Joe Jackson. And so I ran through the door and he looked up and he was like, uh, can I help you? And I was like, yeah, man, we've been coming down here, you know, we've been coming down here a bunch of times and trying to meet you. And he was like, Well, uh, what can you do? And I said, I can sing and I can dance, you know what I mean? Just like your son, right? I, and I'm and I, he said, somebody come turn some music on for this boy. And he, they, they turned the music on. And I went to dancing and, and singing. And shoot, when my dad came back, we was in. And from that point on, he managed us. And he would give us a monthly stipend. I think it was like three or 4000 a month. Um, we recorded with some of his producers and some of his people. But we didn't know. Uh, this was for a couple of years. But he did get us a big show at the Roxy, the world famous Roxy. Uh, and we practiced for three months for 12 to 13 hours a day. Um, and it was the most strenuous, rigorous thing that I've ever done, even still in my life, to do something, to recreate yourself, to become really good. And we were, me and my twin at the time were 11, 11 and my brother was five or six. Jay, Jay was five or six. And we practiced and we had a live band. And we did the show and we got five stand ovations and Michael Jackson was actually upstairs videoing the whole thing. They said El DeBarge was up top, but it was actually Michael Jackson because they couldn't announce that he was there because everybody it would have been pandemonium. But that was the experience. I mean, Joe, he would come to San Francisco to our parties. I mean, he was like, he was really like family with us, but we didn't know that he didn't have any power and that he was blackballed. You know what I mean? From, I don't know, from, I guess him being a manager of the Jacksons and being the way he was. But uh, they was off him, and he wasn't able to help us like that. But you, being that young, did you know that what you was getting involved in when that door opened and uh, the, the, the rehearsals and everything your father wanted you guys to be? At that age, did you know what it really was? Or you just having fun or just going with the flow? How, what, what, what was that experience like? To be honest, man, I, all I want to do is make my dad happy. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, we started out with it'd be just me and him in the car, and he'd be rolling and doing whatever he's doing, and I'd be sitting. Remember, this was when the when the Cadillacs had the, remember the middle thing that they had, and, and kids didn't even ride in seatbelts. They would just put you up on the little middle thing. And I would sit on the middle thing, and there were songs that he liked, and that's how he found out that I could sing, was that I would try to learn the songs that he liked, and then I would sing when me and him was rolling. And so, really, it started out as me wanting, just wanting my dad's approval, really. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I didn't know. Nah, but we was like, we what we feared nothing. You know what I'm saying? Cause we he just he we was we were from a place like when you from the hood, like you're not scared to get up and, and dance with somebody. You know what I mean? Like you ain't scared to get up and sing because you trying to you 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 surviving all the time anyway. Like so 
you you we we wanted to get up and and and, and perform and show that we could do what we could do. You know what I mean? And and in the practice, he instilled that in us. And then, so we always felt like we was ready anywhere, anytime because we street performed. You know what I mean? So it's just like it was like second nature, man. And and I always thought that. I mean, my dad is still that at us, but after watching Motown 25, like I thought I was, I thought I wanted to be Michael Jackson. And so whenever somebody gave, gave me a chance to sing or dance, like I, I would just do my thing. Nice, interesting. And during you guys' career, uh, you how can I say it? Uh, you made plenty of money, did plenty of shows, uh, hands shook, uh, uh, shook a lot of people's hands. And I was doing the research, you guys, at a certain point, the record deals didn't go through as you thought it was. So you ended back up in the same place where you was, the projects, or what What was that transition? What Was you back where you started from? If so, can you explain that? Like, so that, so that, was, that was devastating because we, like we just touched on a little bit, at 11, 12, we, we hook up with the Jacksons, but we still, you know, after that, we still, we, even though we was cutting records, we wasn't famous or nothing. I mean, everybody from San Francisco is a small place. So we would go back with the pictures and stuff. And they, I mean, we'd be famous like that. Cause they'd be like, oh my God, these kids are, they were just with Michael Jackson over the summer type thing at school. But we still would do regular stuff. We still would do, this is before we got a record deal. We still would, you know, go to school and, you know, even though recording, do talent shows and still do stuff. Um, but now we're getting a little bit older, you know what I mean? But it's still street stuff going on this whole time. Like my dad is still selling dope. Like he's still, he's still moving around. Um, and then he goes to jail and all in between this, uh, we get a he goes to jail and then we go help him uh, escape from a fire camp. And then we go to, 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 to Los Angeles and we live off of Crenshaw and we practice it and the boys are out now. That's what got us our opportunity. The boys, this group, the boys was on Motown or no, on MCA, and they left MCA with the with the president to go go to Motown. He became the new president of Motown. He took the group with him. The the A and R that got his position, look this guy named Lil Silas, rest in peace. Uh, he signed us because he wanted another kid group because the boys had been successful. That's what opened the door for us. And so now we get this record deal, which we have been wanting. We have been practicing all this time, and that that was the goal. Like, okay. We want, we want to get a record deal. like And so we had met with labels and we and a lot of times the labels would try to split you up. They'd be like, oh, well, he's talented. We like him. Or we like the twins. Or they would, they would, they kept trying to, you know, my dad was like, nah, he would ask me like, well, do you want to stay with your brothers or you want to get the job? I'd be like, nah, like we want to, we want to stay together. And it's just like what you see on TV is so true. Like they try to do whatever they think it should be. They try to carve you out into what they think it should be. And so, you know, you have to stand on your morals and you have to stand on, you know, your foundation like okay now we believe in what we are and so eventually like at 15 we get a record deal um we signed with mca records um my dad is managing of, of, of course but he's on the run from the police the whole time um but he takes over the budget though some of his friends that you know he's old school some of his friends from motown told him how to work the budget told him how to work the a &R guy so he ended up making the record that he wanted to make not what the a &R guy wanted to make, which is a huge mistake in, in the record world. Like, it's just, it just doesn't work. Because if they're not vested how they're supposed to be vested, well, guess what? You need them to spend the promotion money. And so that's really what happened with the Neutron. My dad got this single from, actually, the kid that wrote the song is from Indianapolis. Um, we had, did a talent show out there, and there was a song called My Heart Beats For You, and this kid named Ernest Enoch, he wrote the song. And my dad bought the song from him. It was our first single because he owned it and he had the record company scared of him already. And we put the song out, we had the video, we did Soul Train, we did Video Saw, we did a whole 26 city like promotional tour. It was amazing, sick. Um, and really the label didn't even want to do that. My dad forced him to. He actually got money from one of his uh, associates who was, a, I'm not gonna mention her name, but she was a huge drug dealer out of LA and she gave him 250,000. And we got a freaking Winnebago and he made MCA put us on the road. Again, not knowing that they'll put you on the road, but they may not, they may not, they may not press up enough, so, enough albums. They just did stuff to sabotage us because my dad was forcing them to do all this stuff. So long story short, we do this, we do the um 
promotional tour. So I get a chance to really feel what it's like though. Cause we did high school, we did like a high school tour. So again, high school kids only, they only know what they see on TV. So they would play our song all over the country. And we were on, like I said, on Video Soul, which was the biggest show. And we had the Soul Train. So to these kids, we were famous already. And so as soon as they would be like, you know, the neutrons, my heart beats for you, my heart beats for you, the, the screaming would start. And like, we would just hit the stage and we'd be, ah. like, it, it was, it was insane. And so you get, you get, you get, um, I actually experienced what it was like. And we also did this, also did this say no, it was like, a, this, remember this, I don't know if you guys remember the say no, uh, say no to drugs uh, campaign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We did a Say No to Drugs show that was at the uh, sports arena in L.A., and it was maybe ten to 15,000 high school kids. And it was insane. Like, I mean, just so you get I'm just saying this to give you a picture of we do this little tour. We do the biggest at the time we did. We did. We did Soul Train when Don Cornelius was doing it. So it was still like, you know what I mean? The show for mm -hmm. for groups, especially uh, black groups. And so we do all of that. The song comes out. It goes up. I think it went to number 25 or number 26 on the Billboard charts, which is a ah, smile success. They didn't drop the second single because they were mad at my dad. So he went up there. He threatened them. They put, he got back in jail. That's when, now we're living in LA. And when you're in LA, you don't know how the landscape is. It's like keeping up with the Joneses. So we had Rolls Royce, we had limousine, we had cars, we had a nice house, but we didn't have no money. And so that's how my twin, I just, I just went back to kind of being normal. Like I, you know, I mean, people knew that we had been on TV and that we were in a single group or whatever, but I was going to school, I was playing basketball. Like I was experiencing what it was to be a teenager. But my twin, who used to hang out with my dad on the street stuff, hooked up with other street people and felt like he needed to, you know, try to find money for our household. And so that's how he hooked up with the gangbangers and started robbing stuff. And that's how he gets himself killed. And that's what, to what you asked me, that's what takes us back to the projects. Mm -hmm. So we go from this big, nice house in Diamond Bar, right back to where we came from, to the projects in San Francisco. And it was absolutely devastating. I mean, this all happened in a matter of six months. So for a kid, you, you lose your twin. You also lose this dream that you had and that you had worked for since, you, since I was, I don't know, nine years old. I had worked. I was the lead singer of the group, and I had worked to get this record deal. We get the record deal, and it's gone like, like that. Wow. And it was absolutely devastating in a bunch of ways the shame of everybody seeing us on TV and then now we're back in the projects. You know what I mean? The shame of we're supposed to be, you know, having some status and some money, and, but yet my twin is robbing stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The shame of making it all the way to LA and being on TV and now being back and being regular, catching the bus not having no money again. Like just, I mean, it's, it's devastating. I mean, I, I think actually being a kid probably makes it easier because if you're a grown person, it's like, okay, where do I go from here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So for me, that's, that's where my testimony began though. That's where, you know, obviously I didn't know that, but that's where that dream ended. And my journey started, if that makes sense. Absolutely. That's, that's where, you know, I, I didn't, and we kind of talked about this before, me and you, I didn't, um, black people don't really do therapy. No one said, man, bro, that was rough. That's heavy what you just went through. Probably you should go see a therapist. Like no one, you know what I mean? No one ever said, no one ever said that to me therapy was not a thing you know so I dealt with it the best way that I knew how which was all I knew was gr girls you know and so I medicated with sex and women and you know not knowing that 
you know, that also is a way to tear up your life. You know what I mean? And so, uh, like I said, at the time I'm 16, by the time I'm 23, I got five kids with four different women because now I'm not living, I'm surviving. And so, like, even my wife had asked me before, like, what were you thinking? That's the thing. I wasn't thinking. Because I didn't think I was going to make it to be 25 anyway. So there was no, I wasn't making future plans. I was only surviving minute to minute. If that makes sense. It does. Mm-hmm. It does. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, Bobby, regarding your um, music career, um, you transformed from uh, R&B singer to a gospel artist. Um, what was that transition like for you? Or what, what was that like for you, just in general? It's weird because I think some people transition uh, from R&B or mainstream to gospel when they feel like they can't be hot in that realm anymore. But for me, I'm a songwriter, I think, first. And whatever you write has to be authentic, right? So I was no longer, after I got married at 30, I couldn't sing about being in the club no more. I couldn't sing about or rap about, or not rap, write. I couldn't write or sing about being in the club. I couldn't write and sing about chasing after these women. I couldn't write, you know what I mean? Like, I, mm-hmm. that, that wasn't what I was doing anymore. So the transition happened authentically for me. I, I now was in a space where I was like, okay, I've, I've chased this, uh, this R&B or this fame thing. I chased it all the way up until I was 29. You know, I didn't, we didn't touch on that, but I was signed to Death Roll as well after. That's a hilarious story we'll have to talk about. But, you know, when I was still chasing, I was, you know, even to the point to where I was signed to death row. Come on, like, that's, are you really? Like, are we that desperate? Like, we gonna, we gonna go on death row? Like, come on. But to me, it was another opportunity because Suge was powerful. You know what I mean? So I was like, all right, like, I know he does this rap stuff, murder rap, but he also has had some R&B singers and I'm tired of dealing with the middle people. I'm gonna be dealing right with the owner. That's the reason why I signed to death row because I didn't want to be dealing with A&Rs and all these you know, gatekeepers and all these people that have been keeping me out since I was 16, how I felt, you know what I mean? Um, so that's a good segue to what she asked me. Like I, after, you know, trying death row, that was the last straw. Like I, for me, trying to chase fame, trying to chase R&B, like, okay, so we tried that, you know, that didn't work out. And now I've said before, like God blocks these things because he, he didn't have that for me. So it was so authentic. When I look back now, I'm like, ah, oh, that's every single time. Like, that's however he has to do it. God will do it because he's playing chess. He's not playing checkers. You know what I mean? Like, what looks like so devastating to us, God is like, no, that's just a pawn. And I have to sacrifice pawns to protect the king and the queen. You know what I mean? To protect these pieces. I'm not the king or queen, but to protect the pieces, I'm one of the pieces on the board that he's been protecting the whole time. And so my transition to gospel was authentic because, again, like my life changed. There were life changing things that happened. You know, at uh, 30, me and my wife got married. And so now, like, I, again, I can't be singing about these wild things in the club and be drinking and the, all the content that's in these R&B or mainstream songs. I can't be do writing or doing those kind of things. So I had to be authentic to who I was, who I was or who I had become, which was now a new creation. And so now that I'm a new creation, I'm, I'm now singing and telling my testimony and I'm not glorifying those things no more, but now glorifying the fact that I've overcome them. Mm-hmm. And that being, you know, sex addiction and, you know, uh, uh, being addicted to chasing after women, and, you know, being a cheater and, not being able to commit to nothing. The stuff that, that that's so cool, you know, uh, drinking. And I never really did drugs like that, but even even that kind of stuff. Drug, I mean, all the things that I, I, I've, I've overcome, you know what I mean? Like now I can tell my testimony and not glorify it, but glorify the fact that God has brought me through those things. And I have, and, and, and I have peace. That's the biggest thing. Like, I just think 
God knows that too. Like the the, the thing I told you, I experienced the, the screaming women, and like that was like that that drug is probably more potent or more addicting than than any other drug you could think of. Adoration. Yeah. You know what I mean? People worshiping you. That drug is. I mean, because when the it's it, it's weird when the phone stops ringing, or when people stop saying your name. That's tough. That's a tough thing to deal with. Like having a major label sign you and then having to be independent, it's tough. You, you would have thought it would, could be something like an exit plan. Don't you know you finish, you don't want to run your business anymore, you have an exit plan or this, this, and that. Uh, mentally, you're an artist and you're going through all these things as a youth and young adult. Like, who is there for? the exit plan, you know, like to give you the, 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 the spiritual guidance and to show you the way to be a better person. Like, where's that at? I mean, I think honestly, I had, I had gone so far in the world. I had gone as far as I could go, man. I mean, to be honest, I, I, you know, I was using women for money. I was, you know I mean? I was, I was, I was, I was, I was as bad as you could be, man to be honest. And I had gone as far as I can go. And, 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 and to the world standards, I was doing really good. I had a really nice car. I had, you know, the, all the, the, the name brand clothes, the Dolce and & Gabbana and the, the Gucci. And I had all of it. And I had, you know, I had a girl, girl giving me money. I had this when I was on there for all. I had Suge giving me money. I, you would have thought I was killing it. I had a jewelry, you know what I'm saying? But the anxiety that I felt at nighttime when I was alone. It was, I can't even explain it. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. I would be up to three, four in the morning with this anxiety, with this feeling in my gut. Uh, and the only thing that would help me sleep was to pray. And so to say I had an exit plan, I didn't. Again, because like I told you, I was just surviving, so I didn't have no exit plan. And nobody ever taught me the right stuff to do because I come from the dirt. I come from the hood. I come from a gangster. I come from, you know what I'm saying, people who used cocaine, who, you know what I'm saying, like, who they, that's how they coped. You know, my parents, that's how they coped. Like, I mean, it's so crazy because people in my family, like, they look at me and my brothers and sisters, and they're like, you guys are an absolute uh, miracle. You know, the fact that you guys are not dead or in jail is is an absolute miracle. The fact that you guys can hold down jobs and that you guys are good parents. And I mean, it's an absolute miracle. I mean, it's nothing but God. You know, so but I did have one. I call my most spiritual friend, uh, my, my guy, Brick Stearns. He when I was 28 and I was going through all of this, he wrote music with me. This is what I'm saying. Like, this is this is how God uses. They'll say like angels or he puts people in your life that, you know, they can tweak it just a little bit. Mm -hmm. They can ask you a question or they'll, he just kept being like, man, I would tell him. He would laugh at me, be like, man, you, you funny dog. Cause he, he, he from Texas, he's so country. He like, bro, you need, to, like, you need to try something else. He kept being like, you need to try something else. And I'd be like, what? Like, because he knew I had all these girlfriends and I was running the streets wild and I was signing that bro. He was like, bro, that's not it. Like, you need to try something. I'd be like, what? And he'd be like, you need to go to church. And I'd be like, church? Man, I ain't going to no church. You know, like, you said that to somebody from the hood. They're like, you know, they think like Baptist singers. They think like hot church and sweat and take five hours. You know what I mean? Like, they just think like, nah, that's not. So I'd be like, nah, that's not. And it's so square. Like, I'm not doing that, right? So he kept saying it to me. And eventually I got so tired of me, you know, doing it my way and it not, you know, it not working out or not having a peace about it. And so eventually I tried it, man, and, and he invited me and I went and I took, who's my wife now, she was my girlfriend at the time, I took her with me. And then we end up in the choir and, and then the, now the pastor saying, ain't no shacking up in my church. So we had to get a little more serious, you know what I'm saying? So now we're doing the couple's counseling, you know what I'm saying? And eventually we made a choice. You know what I mean? Me and her. And I knew she was the one um, because I was, I was, 
you know, I'll be honest, I'm shallow. I'm, I'm shallow. You know what I mean? But to, to me, she was just so beautiful and there was something different about her. Might have been because she was a Midwest girl. You know what I mean? It had to be. There was something different about her. And um, I was able to be faithful to her for a year before we got married. And that's how I knew. That's how I knew it was possible for me to get married. I was faithful for a year. We went to Vegas. We got married. And I ain't never looked back. It's been, it's been 18 years. Um, and I can truly say it's only, only with God that I've been able to stay faithful, that I've been able to walk it out, that I've been able to be a better father, uh, that I've been able to put my pride and my ego aside about being famous and, and, and you know what I mean, try to use my gifts for good, try to use my gifts to glorify God. Um, so I can go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're gonna wrap it up real soon yeah um, so um what led real quick what led you want to to empower the youth the last question <laughs> um I, it's so weird um that too i think is organic um i just moved me and my family i'm from cali through and through but i just moved uh my family to champaign illinois um which is how I met you guys, uh, obviously through the grace of God. Um, and I really feel like, cause I asked God, cause I, we have been toying with the idea of moving to Champaign for about five years. And I just kept being like, nah, that ain't for me. That ain't for me. And um, I was, I've always kind of done stuff with kids cause I'm a basketball guy. So I've coached oh, probably for the last, on and off for probably the last, 15 to 20 years. Um, so I coached kids through basketball. And I, that was kind of, I guess that was kind of my ministry with them. You know what I mean? At that time was basketball, like coaching, you know, coaching the defense and being persistent and being, you know what I mean? Being, being, sports is a good way to teach kids. You know what I mean? To empower them to overcome things, you know, cause you, you got to teach them how to win and how to lose. Um, and so I think that was one of the things that, I asked God to make it plain. Like, if I'm supposed to move to Illinois, show me. And boy, did he. You know, like, I had things turned upside down in my job. People that know God, they know, like, when he does it, your life gets turned upside down. I was coaching basketball. That ended. Uh, we were able to find a really nice house out here, like, that they didn't put on the market. And people know the housing market was really hot. So, you know what I mean? Like, somebody that didn't put it on the market and, you know, was willing to sell it to us for the normal price. I mean, all these things, you know, and then I get out here and I, I meet, I meet people and these people have nonprofits and you know what I'm saying? You, you, I meet, I meet some other people and they're like, Hey, like we work at the school. Would you like to come and talk at our school? And, and then I just, God kind of showed me like all these things, all this journey that I've had you on. That's the thing that you're going to use to relate and connect with these kids. You know, the fact that you've been in a group home, the fact that your parents were on drugs, the fact that you were really poor, the fact that, you know, you, you've done a little bit of college, but you, you have a really good job that pays you six figures. You know what I mean? You were able to, you, you found out that you were good at sales. It's not just music, you know? So I just, I think I could be in a space that would connect with the kids, but also show them that we can overcome you know, tragedy. I, you know, we would relate in tragedy, me and a lot of these kids, because you know, I've, I mean, my twin. I watched my twin die at 16. My mom died at 49. My dad just passed a couple years ago. Um, we can use tragedy to triumph through things. You know what I mean? It doesn't always have to be, you know, stay tragic. Now, I'm an optimist. Also, I believe in God. I believe God teaches through these things. You know, so I've, I've learned valuable, valuable lessons in my tragedies because I look back and I, I ask. I think it's what everybody should do. If you're a real believer, you should look back and, and, and look back and see what is God doing in those situations? What is he saying to me? How is he speaking to me spiritually? In the flesh, you won't understand. It. But if you look back in the spirit, you can absolutely hear God talking through those things. And so that's what I've been able to do. I literally look back on every situation. I'm like, 
where was I at in my life and what was God trying to show me in those situations? Mm-hmm. And then it helps us move forward Absolutely. with peace. Yeah. So Bobby, we just want to, you gave a, a handful of great information and we love you for that. We love our connection, everything, uh, the time we spend, spending together, the inspiration. So thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Man, I thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for having me. Um, I love to tell my story and I hope that some, even if just one person hears it and it blessed them, then it's done its job. So I thank you guys so much for having me and giving me a chance to tell my story. Um, and, uh, you know, you guys already know, I, I think that we're going to do some powerful work together. Okay. Go ahead.